All right, so we are going to talk about multi-layer perceptron. And this is an extension of what we have studied so far. We have learned a single layer perceptron, and I have convinced you that it is almost useless in any practical problem. And that's why we want to uh, cascade all these single layer perceptrons together to construct a multi-layer perceptron uh, that is a step closer to, to, to the deep neural networks what we have today. And so what I want to do is to uh, introduce this concept of multi-layer perceptron. And I want to um, quickly introduce this idea called the, the bad propagation, something that you must have heard uh, before if you have any experience in deep learning. Bad propagation could sound very mysterious. You normally just treat it as a black box. If you go online, you try to read the, the notes, you'll find that they illustrate bad propagation by a bunch of numbers, and then you don't really know what they are. So my job here is to give you uh, a little bit more systematic way of looking at this bad propagation. I am not going to ask you to implement bad propagation because it will not be fun. Uh, however, I want you to get uh, some really, really uh, core idea of bad propagation and remember that bad propagation is nothing more than chain rule, okay? All right, so that's the plan for today. I want to talk about multi-layer perceptron, and then we'll talk about bad propagation. So here's the outline. The first half of the lecture, we will introduce a thing called the hidden layer. Now, remember in the previous lecture, when we talk about single-layer perceptron, you only have input, and then you have a sigmoid function, you get an output, okay? There's nothing in between. Very simple linear formation model, and then you have a nonlinear activifier. Uh, now, uh, in this multi-layer perception, of course, you're going to have multiple layers of the neurons, and then we are going to see how these can get connected and how this will change the, uh, the landscape of your problem. And we also want to look at the matrix representation of, uh, of this hidden layer uh, um, uh, 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 multi-layer perceptron. And then we will talk about bad propagation, a method to uh, update the uh, network parameters when you have multiple layers. This is the starting point of our discussion. Assume that you have a list of neurons, okay, or that you think that they are the input uh, nodes, or you can think that as the input features. Think in whatever way you want, okay? They are the input. It could be pixel, it could be uh, speech to magnitude, it could be some, some crazy feature transform. It, it's just something, okay? It's an m-dimensional vector. Uh, you, you are going to take a weighted average because uh, you are going to look at a thing called W transpose x plus uh, W zero. Uh, this is a linear discriminant function. And in this diagram, you are going to form a, uh, a weighted average, meaning that you multiply each node by a weight, you sum them up. Uh, of course, there's also a offset term, we call it the bias term. You add everything together, that will give you the discriminant function. And then you, you pass it through a sigmoid function, or in general, it is just a nonlinear activation function that could be, uh, that could be a sigmoid, that could be a, 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 like a step function, that could be a linear response, that could be anything, all right? So here we're assuming that it is a sigma function because we like that, it's differentiable, you have all these nice properties we learn in the logistic regression. All right, and now the output will give you something. And imagine that the slope is sharp enough that you only get plus one or minus one, and you compare this with your, your ground truth label, and then if they match, you're happy, they don't match, not happy, and then you feedback. There's an optimization module, you update all these weights until uh, most, uh, if not all, of these training labels, they are correct. So this is the single layer perceptron, right? Single layer, only have one layer, add things up, uh, and then non-linear non activation. So lives are easy. However, people are, of course, not um, they're happy with a uh, single layer, and so they introduce a concept called a hidden layer. Now. This hidden layer is nothing mysterious, but just putting a few nodes in between. In this illustration, you see that I have four inputs, and I have three uh, hidden, uh, one hidden layer that contains three nodes, okay? 
Uh, the number of nodes in the hidden layer does not need to be the same as your input. It can be more, it can be less. Okay. Now, what you may ask, why do you want to be more? Well, that could be some applications you actually want to expand that. Okay. For example, in the super resolution problem, where your input is a low resolution image, and then you want to make it bigger. Okay. So then you your hidden layer will become bigger. Um, so this is called the hidden layer. Now, you can see that by adding one hidden layer here, the, the, the linear response is not changed. Okay, imagine that in between you, you, are, you have not put any nonlinear activation. There is just a bunch of weights multiplied with your input, and then another set of weights multiplied with the hidden layers, and then you add things up, and then you put a nonlinear activation. So in terms of the algebraic operation, it shouldn't be too different from a very simple one-layer perceptron. You're just adding one more layer of matrix vector multiplication. That should be something that we would expect to see. If you, if you do this multi-layer with really a lot of layers, you just cascade on these matrix vector multiplication multiple times, and then you will still have uh, a, a gigantic operation that can be described by one matrix vector multiplication. So what do I mean is the following. Suppose uh, you have uh, M nodes, and then you have, uh, you have uh, two hidden layers here. The hidden layers, they will have uh, different ways of index. Uh, the, 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 the bigger index, okay, so the upper index, uh, uh, this, this one and two. This one refers to the first uh, layer. Okay, that's just the typical indexing of, of, of a uh, multi-layer perceptron. And then the two, it means that that is the, uh, the, 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 second, the second node. Okay, so now you have a bunch of input nodes, and then you have uh, one layer, two layer, each layer you have a set of nodes, and then they will form some kind of linear combination add together to give you the final output. So how do I describe uh, the operation? We can look at this case. Suppose you are looking at the first node of the first layer, okay? Uh, forget about all the other layers and forget about other nodes. Just the first node of the first layer. You look at this graph. We call them a graph because it's connecting node and node. Okay. And so you look at this graph. Now you have four edges. These are the input. And you, you look at what are the weights on these edges. Here the edges would be what? Would be W1, W2, W3, and W4. Okay. And then these are the weights for uh, the weights add layer one, and then they're connecting uh, your your node to this output node. Okay, and so now I can write this as a matrix vector multiplication. You can see that uh, for each row that I am having in this matrix, it will be a, a row vector, and then they are all indexed by a, a superscript one. That means you are all on layer one. Okay, so this is the first layer. And then now you have two indexes. The two indexes says that you will end up having uh, a neuron one for the output that comes from input one. Okay, it's a little bit complicated, but if you think a little bit deeper, it, it, it is the index. Okay, so now this is, this is the edge. This edge goes from one to one, so you have one and one. This is two to one, so you're going from two to one of the first layer. Here you're going from n to one, so it is the first layer. Okay? So now you have a set of weights, and then you have a set of neurons, and then you multiply them together. That will give you this matrix vector multiplication, that will give you H11. So that would be the first layer and then the first node. Okay? So this is just Nothing more than matrix vector multiplication. Okay, why do I call it matrix? Because you have a matrix of uh, numbers. Okay, these numbers they will correspond to all these individual edges. When do you go to the second row? Well, when you go to the second row, you will have an, a second set of weights. When you go to the last one, you will have another set of weights, and that correspond to all these 
rows. Now, the difference between this multi-layer perceptron and then the, the uh, uh, single-layer perceptron is that in single-layer perceptron, you only have one, okay? You have a bunch of input nodes, and then you just go to one output, and that, that means you only have one, okay? You only have one layer. If you have uh, a hidden layer, then it really depends on how many nodes you have in that hidden layer that will define how many rows that you will have. If you want to do one more uh, propagation, when you go to the outputs, then of course you will have a vector that contains just three weights in this example, and then the three weight will multiply with these uh, n numbers. Uh, in this case, it will be three. Uh, so you multiply with these three numbers to give you the final output. Okay, so you can see that it is a matrix vector multiplication followed by matrix vector multiplication at the end to the end you just do a linear operation, which is a row vector multiplying with a column vector. This is a very simple summary of um, what we have in this um, progression to deep linear neural networks. And by linear, I mean that there is no nonlinear activation in between. Uh, if you have a single layer uh, network, it's, it's written as this. If you have a hidden layer, then uh, on top of this operation, you also have a, a matrix. Now, if you want to get to the output, of course, you, you do another uh, w trans, small w transpose h, and then you can get the output. Two hidden layers, you have w1 and w2. Three hidden layers, w1, w2, w3. And hidden layers, you have just a sequence of n matrices. Okay? So if you view it this way, then the deep neural network, uh, deep linear neural network, is nothing too complicated. It's just a stack, a sequence of matrix and vector multiplications. Um, <clears throat> so when you have a problem, then what is being uh, done by this hidden layer can be seen in this example. So let's say you are looking at uh, the nist data sets when you have the, the, the digits from 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 9. Then all these uh, hidden nodes they could uh, represent uh, a feature like these. So when you have an input image going to this um, neural network, uh, what well, the network is going to take a weighted average of all these pixels or features, and then they are going to map to this one. And this number, now, now this, these are the features, and then these features, uh, when you take the uh, average, okay, or, or when you take the weighted average, they can form a, a result that shows this. Okay, so here it would be an example where you have uh, four parts of this image, and then let's say um, these uh, edges they are literally just adding things up; they're all equal. Okay, and then at this point it will just add things up. Okay, so then then you're looking at uh, a combination of all these responses. Now, of course, this is a visualization, okay? It's, it's not exactly what's going on in the network, but this visualization will tell you if you have multiple uh, layers, then you are accumulating the, uh, from the low level features, you're starting to add things up and you say that by adding these up, I'm going to construct a somewhere, something called an intermediate feature. And then by adding things up further, I'm going to glue all these intermediate features to something called the high-level features, and that will propagate until the end, and then you can make the decision. This diagram uh, is, a, um, is extract from an um, online um, paper, which uh, is something that we have seen before, which says that if you have an image, and then these are the input layers, and by propagating through all these hidden layers, you can see that the features, they become more and more complicated. And until the end, uh, when you're making the output, you're saying that this output would become a linear combination of these. And then I'm going to put a, um, a, 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 a nonlinear activation to get my decision. Okay. All right, so this is the uh, interpretation of a hidden layer. Now, the more interesting question that um, most people will ask is, then uh, given this uh, multiple hidden layers, how are you going to actually learn the weights? Or in other words, if you go back to our pipeline, how are you going to define your optimization module 
then you, you take a loss and then you're going to update your weight. How are you going to do that? Uh, it looks difficult because here you have a sequence of L uh, 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 layers. And if you only have one, that should be easy because it's just two norm square of the, that, that, that loss. And it's a convex problem, it's very doable. But if you have two, it's already becoming a little bit tricky. If you have n uh, L layers, then this problem doesn't seem to be that hopeful, okay? Now you can of course say, uh, all right, I'm going to run gradient descent. How are you going to define that gradient descent uh, algorithm when you have a sequence of all these uh, uh, layers? Uh, so that goes to uh, the concept of bad propagation that was uh, first proposed by, uh, by, by, by these authors back in 1986. Okay, so they showed that, that uh, if you do a very careful bookkeeping, and gradient descent, you're going to uh, solve for these sequence of L's, okay, L, L weights. And that's bad propagation, which we're going to look at at a high level what it is uh, doing. Another more difficult question that people usually ask, actually it has been asked for 30 years, is that um, what is the optimization landscape of this problem? Now, because you have a sequence of L weighting matrices, and clearly, it is no longer a convex problem. Uh, but what what is that? Okay, will you get a lot of local minimum? Uh, will you get a lot of settle points? Uh, can you guarantee that by running gradient descent, you are going to get a global minimum point? What is the optimization landscape? Uh, and so uh, there are some work uh, back in 1989. People showed that if you only have two, then good news. Okay, because uh, this problem is non convex. However, uh, the solution to this problem uh, is the PCA. Okay, that, that can be proved. Uh, because you only have two layers, then uh, uh, you also assume some kind of rank as assumption on the W1, W2 matrices, then it is exactly the same as running a PCA, principal component analysis. Um, uh, and so the global minimum would be the leading K uh, principal components. That is the global minimum. If you, if you choose not the, not the K leading, um, um, principal components, you just choose other, uh, principal components, you will end up having a critical point, okay? And that critical point is not a global, is not a local minimum, it's a settled point. You can also prove that. Uh, that also shows you that uh, the, all the local minima that you're going to find in this problem, if you only have two layers, uh, they're all global, okay? All local minima are global, okay? Because there's no local minima. All, all the critical points, they're settled points. Okay, so that was a major uh, a breakthrough in 1989. And this mystery holds when uh, it's still unclear when you have a, a, a sequence of LWs, okay? If you have a lot of these uh, layers, then it remains unclear uh, whether you will get the same set of conclusions, meaning that all the local minima are global and all the critical points are settled points. That was not clear. Um, and so uh, three years ago, it was finally proven that the conjecture is true that if you have a, a, a sequence of L uh, matrices, uh, the same set of conclusion also holds, okay? Uh, there's no local minima. Every local minima is global. In addition, uh, 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 the critical points are settled points. You only have bad points or global, okay? That's a very, very striking result. And um, the same uh, paper further showed that the, um, the conclusion will hold if you put nonlinear activations, okay? That's even more striking. If you put nonlinear activations, you will also get the same set of results. Of course, there are under certain additional assumptions that you want to make, okay? Uh, I was very happy to invite the speaker to come here tomorrow, but then in, in the end, the, the, the seminar is canceled, okay? However, we, I would really encourage you to look at the paper. Uh, the paper is, is a little bit deep. However, it, it gives you a lot of details of how this can be made possible. Okay. The proofs is a little bit involved, but however, the, the technique is actually elementary uh, linear algebra. Okay, so take a look at that. It was a really, really a major breakthrough in, in, in this uh, uh, optimization landscape. There's a question. Uh, 
So the question is, why don't we just merge all the W into one? Right? Why don't we merge all the Ws into one? So let me give you an example. Uh, just talk about two. Okay, let's talk about two. So if you have a two uh, W, uh, then essentially what you're doing is a structure like this. Okay, so this is uh, W1, this is W2. Because imagine that I really set the rank of my matrix to be smaller than the dimension. Okay, now what I'm doing is a thing called the auto uh, encoder and decoder. That's a very, very typical neural network architecture. So you ask, uh, why don't you just merge everything to one matrix? Well, if you merge everything together, you lose the rank constraint, right? You are not able to say that my encoder can only have rank K while the ambient dimension is N. That means you cannot say that I'm going to squeeze information from my data. And so the output in this layer is no longer going to be a code word or the latent representation, and then you cannot use a decoder to decode it, that will just defeat the purpose, okay? So the entire business here is to have a sequence of all these, and so you can, you can, you can say at each layer, what kind of thing that I want to get out? I want to have a latent representation of this rank that can propagate through many, many layers, okay? So um, this autoencoder and decoder structure, as I said, if you only have two, and they are, they're limited by rank K, then there is a unique solution, which is the PCA, and picking the leading K eigenvectors. However, uh, if you pick the other eigenvectors, it will still be a reasonable decoder, but then it's, encoder and decoder, but it's just not as good as the, the leading eigenvectors. Uh, and that's why you can, you will have saddle point, but it's not global minimum. Okay, so that's the auto encoder, uh, decoder uh, business. Now, if you're interested, I can talk more about this, okay? Because auto encoder and decoder is perhaps the simplest architecture uh, you can find in the neural network, uh, in the deep neural network literature that can uh, give you some uh, concrete answers uh, of its performance limit. Now, if you have deep networks, it's a lot harder to say anything because you have all these uh, nonlinear activations, it's just a lot harder. Okay?